2021. And we're so glad you're here. In this week's Bible reading in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And if you know how to give good gifts to your children, and how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? In this gift-giving season, the best gift we've ever received from the Father is Jesus coming down as a child and living among us. And what joy we get to partake of as the Holy Spirit now lives within us. And we get to give that away to other people. So as we enter into worship, ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be given unto you. So let's get up on our feet and adore the Lord with all of our hearts and with all of our praise. Welcome to church! Welcome to church, everybody, on this snowy Sunday morning. We're glad you're here. Hey, we're going to sing some Christmas songs this morning. Is that all right? All right. All right. It's an appropriate thing to do. Give our praise to the Lord, for He is worthy. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's see. Oh, come. saints, whether online or in person, and to lift you up, God, to lift you up. The reason for the season, the reason for our lives, God, the reason for the joy of our salvation, God, Jesus Christ, you're so worthy, Lord. And oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. Till he appeared and the soul fell. 
God. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Yes, God. Put your power and glory, Lord. Let us proclaim that, God. Let us proclaim that, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. this morning, God. We, we give you praise. There's, there's turmoil in the world, not remotely in our area like it was when you were born, God. But even so, Lord, we say rejoice, rejoice, because the King has come. You are so worthy, God, this Prince of Heaven. Yes, God, you're so worthy, Lord.
asked me what is truth I ask you what is peace but not a great settling of issues undone for I came to not only bring you peace but to cause a great settling in the world and in you as an individual no matter the cacophony of the times or the turbulent of the sea which you seem to be on, there has been, past tense, a great settling because I came and I did what no one else could do. So in these days, I ask you, what is peace? Is it provision? Is it satisfaction? Is it fortresses? Or is it the settling that only one could settle? Your sins are forgiven. At some point you need to just accept that. Even though your sin be heinous, pre-planned, premeditated, or completely disgusted, when it's forgiven, it's forgiven. Hallelujah. And you should, do, you should go forward with that instead of having to work it off. A part of why I came was a great settling, a pivot for history. Do not dismiss it as a nice story. This set a post that no one else could set. And it's for you, not just for society, it's for you first, but let it be so. Things that were undone, let them be settled. The pathway is open. The coast is clear. Provision is at my right hand. Come and get it. But let there be a settling. And in the settling, a confidence to proclaim what settled you when nothing around you looks like it's settled. Let it go forth with great proclamation again and again and again. And when it hits you again like a wave, let you be settled for this matter has been settled and you can stand erect and unmoved. The birth of a baby, the birth of Christ our Savior. It is a beautiful story, but it is not where the story started. The story started with creation. And this birth, it is the middle of the story. It is a pivotal point because without it, the earth would still be lost. But he, but he came that we might find our peace and find our way in the story that is still unfolding. That story will accumulate when he comes again. 
Until then, we can hang on to what it is that he has brought so far, the power, the majesty, the glory, and the strength that he gives us each and every day. Eventually, though, this story will end, and a new story will begin, and that story will be the story of eternity. And this story of eternity is beautiful, and it is there, and it is real. As you keep on the path now, and as you remember the birth of this baby, and you remember how this story is going to end in the second coming, then you will be assured that you will be part of the eternal story as well. know you, this Prince of Peace, that we can know you, God, this Prince of Peace, and in light of that, we can confess our sins and lay everything down at your feet, and with gladness sing, and with gladness sing, so Lord, this year, this season, this week, Lord, we just lay down any burden, because you've made a way, as a, as a prophet said. You've made a way. You've made a way, God. Let us not grow calloused to the gift of laying our burdens down, of confession, of confessing our sins, Lord. Lord, we stir that up this morning, Lord. We stir that up this morning, God, and say, thank you, Jesus, that we can know you. We can draw close to you through the blood of Christ, God. spotless lamb that came as a baby. Thank you, Lord. So we stir that up this morning. Let's just sing that again. We can know him, this prince of peace, in light of mercy, confess our sin. Jesus feet and with gladness sing. Yeah, he's strong enough. Lord, the Lord have you know he is strong enough. Let's lay those burdens down. We can know him. This prince of peace. In light of your mercy. In light of mercy. We confess our sin.
Hallelujah, Lord. Father, what a delight it is for us as your people to remember the son that you gave us. That child that was born. The child we celebrate during this season, his birth. The radiant beams that came from his face. This was God Almighty incarnate in flesh. You came to die for the sins of the world. Lord, we're, we're so blessed by what you did for us that we couldn't do ourselves. But Jesus, Jesus, this beautiful child, this wonderful Savior, would go to a cross and die for us and open up heaven's door forever. Thank you, Lord. We remember you this Christmas season, Lord, with great thankfulness. We see the innocence of the baby there and the wonder and the spectacularness of it all, Lord. But we know where it heads. It heads to our freedom, our salvation our eternity oh man thanks for being so good to us thank you lord i pray father that this christmas we don't forget all that you did for us every ounce of blood poured out for us oh god thank you thank you thank you amen well, do we have anyone this morning with the word of knowledge? If you're not familiar with the word of knowledge, it's simply one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit where the Lord lets us know he's alive and moving today. He may just want to touch you. Amen. Somebody's got pain in the top of their right foot. Pain there. I don't know, got stepped on or whatever, but God wants to touch. And you may be online as well. And if you're online and you're, uh, this is also an issue that you're having, we want to join with you and pray for you and believe that God will heal you supernaturally. Amen. God, we stand together in faith before you. We come in faith before you. We know that you've identified this and, and made it known because you're here to heal. Thank you, Lord. And the part of our Savior coming is the provision for healing in body, soul, spirit. And so let healing come now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God wants to heal something broken in a left hip this morning. Somebody have a problem with the left hip? Great. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for seeing all of us. Thank you for knowing all the details. Lord, and we ask right now that you would come and move in these bones and these muscles and these hips, that you would completely heal these left, left hips that you see, Lord, mm -hmm. touch them with your love and your holiness and your power. Yes, Amen. Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, let's return back to your seats and that. Wish somebody around you a Merry Christmas. Hallelujah. Well, indeed, Merry Christmas. It's good to have you all in the house of the Lord this morning. I, I am uh, actually amazed. It, there was quite a bit of snow out there this morning, and uh, so thank you all that uh, braved the, the, the elements uh, to be here. All of you that are online as well that stayed home, and that's great, man. I'm just glad everybody's safe. Um, we just want to wish you all a very, very uh, Merry Christmas. We're going to have a a great new year, too, I believe. It's going to be a great year here, especially at Living Faith Fellowship. It's been a great last year, and it's going to be a great next year. It's just going to keep getting better and better and better, I believe. Speaking of the snow, I also want to thank our snow removal crew that's here. Um, I know that uh, Robert, Robert Lentz was on this morning, and he got up early and made sure it's all nice and clear out there. So thank you, Robert. Thank you, all of you guys that are on the snow removal crew. We sure appreciate you very, very much as you get up early to make it nice for all of the rest of us here, for sure. 
Also, I want to give one announcement. Um, I know it'll become as a disappointment to some, but we're not going to do our New Year's Eve party this year because of a lot of different, there's, there's about six or seven different elements in there that came together that made it a difficult for us to do, uh, to go ahead with it. But here's what I'm excited about. I'm excited because when we gather together, we do, we, we worship, we bring the new year in, we worship. There's a few prophetic words, and I'm going to try to give you what I feel is on my heart for that year. And I'll do that probably the, one of the first messages of the year. But, but, but what happens, only a few people get to participate. What I would love to see is all of us uh, 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 getting before the Lord, trying to hear what has the Lord got for you for 2022? What is the Lord speaking to us as a congregation? What do you feel that the Lord wants to do in all of us and in you as well? And I would encourage you to gather together as friends and family, whatever size group you want to get into and what, however you want to put that together as you bring in the new year. And I would encourage you to get together and to really seek the Lord and then bring the new year in. Let the little kids hear. Let's hear what they're saying. What are they saying? Uh, uh, parents, I would encourage you to let the kids know, hey, do you feel the Lord is saying something to you, something to us as a family, uh, whatever it may be. I want it to really be an awesome, neat, spiritual time that we're working together with family as well as all of our young kids too. Uh, really, really include them because they're very, very, very spiritual. Those kids have a lot of spirituality inside of them. So draw it out. Ask them. Tell them a couple of days ahead of time that we're going to be doing this. We're going to have put a party together. You'll have your food and friends and all of that. It's going to be awesome. But then also tell them, hey, we're going to have a time where we're going to ask, what does the Lord put on your heart for you personally or for us as a family, for us as a church? And I would love to hear some of those stories. I would really love to hear. If you feel that what, that what your child has is a really good directive for us, I would really love to hear what those things are. So again, I want it to be a very, very super spiritual time for us as we're bringing in and seeking the Lord for the new year. But how cool that we can do it in a more intimate fashion amongst family and friends and a great time there. So please, please, uh, do that. Really allow the Lord to speak to us as families, and let's hear what he has to say, and let's enjoy this next new year in 2022. Amen? All right. Well, I'm going to send it back now to our online greeters. I think it's uh, Aaron and our elf, Dana. <laughs> Yeah, and great. Just wanted to welcome everybody again. You know, if you're new with us this morning and you're here in person, uh, we'd love to connect with you. Um, there's a there's a connect card in the pew rack in front of you. If you wouldn't mind pulling that out and filling it out. And uh, if you're joining us online and you and you have never done that before, you can go on our church app and also fill out that same connect card. We'd love to get in touch with you. Absolutely, and thank you so much for everyone who has joined us this morning online. We have people all over Moscow and Pullman and the Palouse that's joining us, but people also that's traveling for the holidays. We just uh, pray a blessing and safety over you and that you enjoy your Christmas. We have people in Mexico, Ghana, and um, a family even traveling down south. We pray that that uh, travel is also safe, but thanks so much for joining with us this morning. Yeah, and just a, a cool note on, on those who are tuning in online. Um, you know, we can see the, the, the chat line here on, on who's, who's tuning in. And uh, several people received the words of knowledge that yes. were happening here in the building. And so that is just, a, it's a powerful way that God continues to move. And, and so sometimes, you know, we, we think, oh, if, if there's people raising their hand here, cool. But we don't know what, who else possibly. There are people watching online and God is moving in their homes as well. So um, that's just a cool thing to, to be able to connect uh, via virtually here. So now it, it is my privilege to be able to introduce our speaker this morning. And uh, this man has been uh, many things in my life uh, over the years. And, and he has definitely been that father's voice in my head that, that I needed it so many times. And I know that because he would give me advice and I'd be like, whatever. <laughs> But the truth is, Pastor Tom has been, has been such a meaningful mentor to me and my whole family, and I'm excited to hear more about what he has to say this morning. So will you join with me and welcome Pastor Tom Weaver. Thank you, Aaron, for interpreting what uh, whatever meant. I, that, finally, I understand. No, no, Aaron has been like a son for sure. He's an incredible man of God blesses our church in so many ways. Well, hey, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. 
Merry Christmas. You know, we have people, we have people here that drove from La Crosse. And people from Genesee that drove here. Our friends from Genesee. Isn't that incredible? Anybody further than that? That's no, pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, can you believe it? Christmas is here next Saturday. Next Saturday. Actually, for some of you that have those chocolate advent calendars, Christmas has already happened. <laughs> I mean, some of you I know are already working on your second Christmas. You went and got another one. Yeah. Some serious Christmas celebrators. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love Christmas. I do. I've grown to love it more and more and more. I love all the things I used to call, oh, that's just all glitz and materialism and all this. I love the fact that people are putting lights up. I don't know what's in their heart, but I call them Christmas lights. They're Christmas lights. I love it. I love that we're leveraging this and that there are glorious lights uh, that are lighting up our town and, uh, and lighting up towns throughout the world. I love Christmas. You know, the trees go up, the lights go up, the numbers on my scale go up. It, it's awesome. It's everything goes up. I love it. <clears throat> Another reason I love Christmas, though, is because we can learn so much about God. I love that. As we look at how he came into the world, we discover so much about who he is, about his character, about how he does things, about what's important to him. At Christmas, no surprise, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. If you think about it, every time someone becomes a Christian, Christ is born in them. They become born again. And Jesus is born afresh on earth. The birth of Christ has been multiplied the world over for a couple thousand years. Seriously. When Jesus was born, it was called the incarnation. God becomes flesh. We see that in John 1, 1. In the beginning, the word was with God. The word was God in John 1, 14. The word becomes flesh. We call that the incarnation. When we are born again, God indwells our flesh. We're going to talk about that today. This multiplies the incarnation of Christ and the body of Christ grows throughout the world. Jesus has been doing some serious bodybuilding for a couple thousand years. Seriously, that's what this whole time period is right now. After his first advent, before his second advent, he's doing some bodybuilding. And we get the privilege of being a part of that. Through our campaigns, like in 2021, that commission campaign we did. Some serious bodybuilding. Led by a bodybuilder himself, Mr. Amir Owens. Oh, yeah. yeah. Over the centuries, many men have wanted to become God. Here, here's a picture of some of them. Recognize some of these faces? Many men have wanted to become God. Seriously, I went to the, I was in Moscow, Russia in the year 2000. And I went through this, this kind of a room of remembrance and there were books with names in it. There were 40 million names of people who were killed by Stalin. 25 million or so in the war, but then there was a lot more that he just plain killed uh, because of men that want to be God. The incredible thing about the incarnation, though, is that our God is the only God who became man. Exactly opposite. These kingdom builders that we saw there, exactly opposite. The opposite spirit. They brought, they wanted to be God, they brought destruction. He wanted to be God, he brought us life, and eternal life, that is. That's our God. 
so different than the ways of man. And not just that, it's not just that he became man. He became man so that he could die and make a way for him to indwell each of us that are his followers. Wow. Emmanuel, God with us. The incarnation of Christ. God became one of us so that we could become one with him. God became one of us so that we could become one with him. He just does things so much differently than the world does things. So our main scripture for today that we're going to dig into is Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Here it is. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this majesty. Uh, majesty, ha, that too. Um, the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, wait for it, go ahead. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Wow. What a powerful scripture. Mystery. Let's talk about mystery here. The mystery that they're talking about, this mystery for ages and generations. For ages and generations, they didn't know when the Messiah would come. For ages and generations, they didn't know who the Messiah was. And then there's another thing, and the reason it was revealed among the Gentiles here, for ages and generations, they could not imagine that Jews and Gentiles would form the one body of the Messiah, the body of Christ in unity together. That was a mystery that was revealed and that was a powerful, powerful truth. Title of my message today is Christ birthed in you, the hope of glory. Christ birthed in you, the hope of glory. I have four points today. I'm going to keep them a mystery, so stay tuned. All right. Number one, Christ birthed in you. You can see how Paul even uses this birthing language in other places in the New Testament. Galatians 4.19, look at this. It says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. If you think about it, Paul wanted each of you to experience Christmas afresh. <laughs> you know, he, wanted, he wanted these Galatians to experience Christmas, to have, have the birth of Jesus formed in them and, and have Christ himself formed in them. And he's going through these pains of childbirth. We see it again in, earlier in Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I love this. This, It's no longer I who live. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Because Christmas has even happened in you. Jesus has been born in you. You have been born again. Let's look at this uh, chart. I used a version of this last year and I revised it this year. It says, uh, here, uh, here we have Jesus. He's on the heavenly throne. Okay. Then he comes down at Christmas. It's the first advent. Jesus becomes flesh. That's Christmas right there. The first incarnation. And then he came down so that Easter could happen, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But then after the death and resurrection was the the ascension. And at the ascension, Jesus rose to the heavenly throne back where he came from, right? He started at the throne, he came down, and now he's back up at the throne. Guess what he's given there? Said the Bible says he's given all authority. And with that authority, the first thing he does is he sends 
his Holy Spirit to indwell his followers, to indwell each one of us that are his followers. He does that at Pentecost. We call that Pentecost. Each of us that has Jesus in us has received a Pentecost, right? The the ministry of Pentecost. And Jesus indwells flesh at that point. That's the second incarnation. We got to think about that. It wasn't just that Jesus became flesh. Jesus indwells flesh right now inside each one of us that are his followers. And so that second incarnation has happened. Guess where we're living now? In between that and that second advent. There's going to be another advent. Jesus is coming back. We're looking forward to it. That's the second advent, and that's glory. Heaven. He's coming back to gather his saints together. And we're going to rise again. And we're going to live with them forever. But right now, our lives are in this in-between place between Pentecost and the second advent, between the the, the uh, second incarnation and glory. That's where we're at right now. So Christ in us is made possible by that first coming of Jesus. And the hope of glory is pointing to the second coming, the advent, the second advent of Jesus. So Christ in you, the hope of glory, is emerging then of the two advents into the present. Follow this. You live a very real hope today Because of the fact you are redeemed and on your way to glory. And that is all happening at once right now. You are redeemed because of the first advent. The hope of glory is the second advent. And both of those inform your life right now. In the present. I'll explain that a little more. Colossians 3, 4 speaks of this second advent. Our hope of glory. When Christ who is... Get this. Get this wording. I just... I wish we could just stop and seal it and just focus on just the individual phrases here. But it says, when Christ, who is your life, (laughs) think about it in those terms. A lot of times we put other things in that place. You know, this new job is my life. You know, this new wife is my life. You know, like I was talking to Sean. No, anyway, uh, this new, you know, this new you fill in the blank becomes our life. No, when Christ who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. In glory, our hope of glory, we will appear with him. Such a great promise. Paul's focus is on how God's new covenant people are completely, entirely identified with Christ and how that new identity, Paul, 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 uh, Pastor Phil, Uh, otherwise known as Paul, the apostle. Uh, (laughs) Pastor Phil spoke about our identity. Identity is so, so important. And we have a new powerful identity, and that is Christ in us. And he transforms our life now, and he gives gives us hope for the future. Point number two is... Do you realize what point number one means? <laughs> Do you realize what point number one means? God lives in you. He lives in you. Oh my goodness. And he lives in me. You know, sometimes I think about that because I know me and I go, really, Lord? Thank you for that. It truly is amazing grace. Thank you for being with me. And that when I'm going throughout the day saying, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. Oh, merciful God, help me. He's right there. I don't even need to yell it. He can just hear me. He can hear me when I whisper it, when I groan it, when I barely say it. He's right there listening. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, or do you not know? (laughs) Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. It's saying it again, in other words. I'll say it again. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body.
We are not our own. He came at the, at the first advent so that he could, he came at Christmas so he could experience Easter for us. And then he could go up to heaven and then he could send himself to indwell us. That's been the plan for the ages. This has been the mystery for ages and generations. And it came to pass at Christmas. And now we're living the reality of all of this history that's unfolded. This plan that God had ever since the fall. All of this has been God's plan that he's been working through the covenant with Abraham. Through the covenant with Moses. Through the covenant with David. God's been pursuing the heart of man. Even as he worked into the story, those five women, Tamar and Ruth and Rahab and Bathsheba and Mary. Amazing stories, all of them. All in the line of Jesus. He's been working and unfolding his plan in unlikely, surprising ways. So when he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The only one, uh, well, let me, let me, I'll just go here back to my notes. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, during the time of Moses, God's presence dwelt in a tent. We call it Moses' tabernacle. Then David's son Solomon built a temple where God's presence dwelt. So we had a, God's presence was dwelling in a tabernacle. God's presence was dwelling in a temple. Then Christmas happened, followed by Easter and the Ascension and Pentecost. And as a result of all of that, God now dwells in you Amen. and me. That is, if you have received him as your Lord and Savior. And all these promises I'm talking today, about today are available to you online. Anybody here for Jesus to become your Lord and your Savior. The best gift you could ever unwrap. Please do it today if you haven't. And there'll be people up here that'll minister to you afterwards and lead you into that incredible relationship with him. Oh. You have the living God living inside of you right now. Wow. You know, a popular Christmas song. I love this. I just listen to it again. I have the words here. It's just an amazing, amazing song. You should listen to it and just kind of enter into the emotion of the whole thing. And it's by uh, Mark Lowry. And that is, is it Mark? Or, yeah, Mark. Uh, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that that baby boy in you was kicking and doing all those things that a baby boy in a womb does? We had four baby boys, and man, you know, I could feel them on the outside uh, kicking. My wife would go, oh, feel this. Those are such exciting times. But Mary had God living in her. <laughs> Just incredible. Oh, wait, you have God living in you? Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> this gets pretty real. I love some of the lines here. This child that delivered... The child that you delivered will soon deliver you, this baby boy. And when you kiss your little baby, Mary, you've kissed the face of God. Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Can you imagine being Mary in that moment? Reminds me of what we do in our drive through nativity and just the power of it. God does so much more. The Holy Spirit does so much more than we're even realizing. As families come through, I wish every one of you could see the faces of those people that are coming through. Those over almost 3,000 people. Their lights, are, their faces are just lit up. Everybody's good looking. Because they're smiling. And they're in awe at what God has done. And you guys who are participating in that show it all. Thank you for doing that. For that sacrificial love that you show. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But that question, Mary, did you know? That's not just an interesting question for Mary. It can become a powerful question for you. No, I mean, do you really know who has been birthed in you? Pastor Phil, do you know you have the king of all kings living in you? Yes. 
Jacob, do you know that you have a God with bigger guns than you dwelling in you? <laughs> Peter, do you know? Do you know you have the prince of peace, the source of all peace, living in you? And Lindsay, do you know you have the mighty God living in you? Do you know that? Oh, my goodness gracious, that's incredible. Brenda, do you know that you have your God who is love dwelling in you? Mm. And Jesse, do you know you have the Lord of all creation who created all the nations? He's dwelling in you. Wow, do you know? Do you know, Isaac, do you know that the God who in his story called Joseph, who had to adopt Jesus as his son, he's living in you. And you express him well. Do you know you have the mighty God? You have the wonderful counselor. You have him living in you. He's in you. He's in you. He's in each one of you. <laughs> mm. Jesus, thank you for indwelling us. Thank you for who you are. Reveal yourself to us today. Reveal yourself to us today. <laughs> God lives in you. You are God's wrapped presence. You are God's wrapped presence. The presence of God is in you. You are God's wrapped presence, given as a gift to this world. As you bring the blessing of his presence wherever you go, the blessing is of all those qualities that God is that I so inadequately expressed because he's so big and so great, has but you bring them with you wherever you go because he lives in you. Do you realize you're not your own, that you've been bought with a price and you're on a mission? It's called that great co-mission. Co, oh, that's, that's interesting. We're co-missionaries with Christ who dwells in you. And it's always a co-mission. It's never up to you. It's always up to him in you as you take him with you wherever you go. The presence of God to be a blessing so that the presence of God can be unwrapped in your life and people can taste the fruit of what that Holy Spirit in you tastes like. Oh, it's so good. God incarnate, once again on earth. That's not just a song about ancient times from 2,000 years ago. God incarnate right now in you. As Christians, we don't look to the world to get our hope from it. We bring the hope of glory to it. Third point is the hope of glory. Biblical hope is not just a hope so hope. I've said that before. Biblical hope is life shaping certainty about the future. Biblical hope is life shaping certainty. It molds and it shapes who you are. I don't think we even understand the difference that makes in our lives. For those of us that have walked with God for a few decades or, or even just for a few moments or years, well, anyway, what I'm trying to say is I don't think we realize it. Uh, hmm. Biblical hope is life-shaping certainty changes everything about who we are. Living now in a way, living now in a way that is completely changed because of what you know will happen in the future. The difficulty about heaven is we can't see it. Except that sometimes we get a taste of it, right? A taste of heaven. And in many ways, I'm going to end with, with kind of what I think celebrating Christmas can give us. It can give us a taste of heaven. Jesus even talks about a wedding feast. Guess what we're going to do at Christmas? We're going to feast, right? It points to something. It points to glory. Oh, I love that kind of glory. <laughs> Romans 8.11 says, The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead 
dwells in everybody else. Oh. Oh, no. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Wow. Wow. So this is pointing to glorified bodies. How many can say amen? <laughs> amen. Amen. Especially those of us that don't have the glory of youth anymore. Yep. Glorified bodies. Here we go. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, glory here. It's the word doxa. Actually, it's really cool. The word doxology is a, is a combination of this word glory, doxa, with, with logos. So logos is speaking or uh, speaking the word, proclaiming the word. And so you have the word of God. You have worship or, you know, doxa means worship or glory or praise, right? And so a doxology is basically speaking worship and it's worshiping and singing it unto the Lord. So doxa is, what it is, the one uh, definition of it in Thayer's, I believe is appropriate for the, where it's used here, is in, in Colossians 1, 27, you know, this hope of glory I'm talking about, is the glorious condition of blessedness promised that true Christians should enter. Okay, it's kind of an awkward phrase, but that's how it said there. So, is the glorious condition of blessedness promised that true Christians should enter when Jesus returns again. So we get a, a condition of blessed blessedness. We get a condition of blessedness for eternity. We always go around and say, bless you, bless you, bless you. We're going to have an eternal state of being blessed. An eternal state of blessedness. That's the glory we get to enter. It's so hard to talk about heaven because we barely, you know, we, I don't even think we're bumping up against the edges of it when we use words to describe it. But, but you know, we can keep trying. And that's the kind of the cool thing about Christianity. That's what's so fascinating about it, intriguing, and it draws me in, is because we're barely scratching the surface. Even of those of us that are old, we're just barely getting started. Here we go. To maintain, though, our hope of glory mindset, we need to manage our expectations. Follow me on this. So I'm going to use this, this uh, formula, and it's not, it doesn't express entire truth, but it does express a truth, and that is happiness equals reality minus expectations. So I'm going to give some examples that hopefully illustrate this, and this happens at Christmas all the time, and I'll use two examples from my life. As a young boy, believe it or not, some of those of you on stout will, will not believe this, but I used to like be very interested in what my gifts were under the tree. <laughs> <clears throat> You might hear vicious rumors that at our staff Christmas party, I try to cheat and figure it out, but sort of vicious rumors just to set the, set, make things clear. <laughs> and so, uh, and so as, a, as a kid, one year, there was this really heavy, heavy box under the tree with my name on it. You know, back then, heavy to me meant glorious. It meant, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I had such high expectations. Oh, man, I was so jacked. The problem is I had a brother-in-law and, uh, and who married my sister, and he's the one that gave me the gift. And so when I unwrapped the gift, it was actually a box of bricks. <laughs> so you can imagine, expectations here, reality down here. You call that the disappointment gap. Major disappointment. Right? Okay, but there was another Christmas, thank God. <clears throat> and uh, on that Christmas, it was amazing. I really don't know that I had many expectations of it. I was looking forward to gifts, right? I was expecting that. But man, I got a big boy bike. I mean, I'm serious. It was a big boy bike. I mean, my feet couldn't touch the ground. Seriously. Matter of fact, I started riding it on Christmas Day. I'm out there riding it. And I fall over. And I couldn't stop myself. The problem is the garage was right there. Matter of fact, the corner of the garage. And matter of fact, my finger, and I can show you the scar afterward. 
He hit the garage and I had to get stitches on Christmas day. <laughs> but I was so pumped about that bike. Oh my goodness. So when I look at the scar, I just have all these wonderful emotions because my expectations were down here, but my reality was up here. You call that man, I was happy. I was really happy. I even went through the suffering of the injury. I was so happy and it was still happy. So how does that relate to our life? You know what we're promised in this life? What, what are we told to expect? Yeah, we are. We're told to expect trials and tribulations. And Jesus invites us. Matter of fact, he invites us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. What that means is picking up our own suffering journey. He had his. We have ours. Like him. We get to suffer as we do the, we're like, like going through the elements. You know, we have people, one of my favorite comments through drive, for the drive through nativity about all of you that are in it is, man, they are soldiers. Like, you know, soldiering through the elements, suffering so that the gospel can be proclaimed. Our hope of glory enables us to be patient with the difficulties of life now, and we're promised that we're gonna have difficulties. So in life, if we expect if the reality, the, the, what the Bible says is true, that we're gonna have trials, tribulations, difficulty, but reality is we have the hope of glory, that's called the happiness gap. The problem is when our expectations are this world is gonna give us all that we want and need and satisfy the depth of our being, but reality is it's like it doesn't, that's called the disappointment gap because we have misplaced expectations. We have to manage our expectations well. And we could talk about that more, but I'm not going to right now. But we have to manage them well. Sometimes we have to endure some pretty tough things in life. I mean, I had a year seven years ago where I was experiencing things that I had never you know, that you always wish you would never experience. And I had a couple of those things happening all at the same time in my life. Um, but some of you and all of us in some ways may have lost a loved one, right? Those are tough times because we miss them. Or we can have unfulfilled desires like we desire children but we don't have children. Or that wedding you were hoping for. Or that new job that didn't come or the healing that hasn't happened or just the disappointment in relationships because we're never going to be able to come through for each other in an ultimate fashion like Jesus can come through for us. We learned that in mirror class. So we, even in our human relationship, even in the closest one in marriage, we, there's still some disappointment there. We have to manage that well. Otherwise, it doesn't go so well for our spouse when we start demanding them coming through for us in ways that we're never intended to. Relational difficulties. We can have unexpected bills. Or we can have bricks at Christmas. <laughs> but we need to invite Jesus into that mire and muck of life so he can lift us out of it. We invite him into it so he can lift us out of it with a hope that transcends those circumstances. A hope of glory. Christian hope is based on our ultimate future state not our present circumstances. Jesus had the joy set before him as he endured the cross. We have the hope of glory living in us now and set before us as we endure everything that we have to endure in this life. Matter of fact, Romans 8 says it straight up. So I'll just go there. Romans 8, 18 through 24 in the New Living. It says this, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Having said that, let me just put a parenthetical in there. I'm not trying to discount anybody's suffering. It's real. And it, and it really is, um, it, it is uh, deserving of empathy, the suffering you go through. is deserving of empathy. So don't hear lack of empathy. But do hear perspective and context. 
It says, yet what we suffer now is nothing, nothing. It's nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So let hope arise. Like Pastor Phil said in his message, let the day star arise. Let the morning, the, the morning star arise in us. That morning star is Jesus. Let him arise. Let him become preeminent. Let our hope of glory be preeminent. For all creation is waiting. Matter of fact, it's not just you. It's all, every, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse, the curse because, as a result of sin. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Aren't you looking forward to that? It's okay to look forward to that. It's okay to look forward. We gotta take time to look forward to heaven where there's no more death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, don't we? We also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. We still groan. He hears your groan. And he said he can sympathize. He can sympathize with it because he went through it. He was born as a baby so he could truly be our wonderful counselor. What counselor would you trust that hasn't lived life? So if he just came as an adult to save us, that wouldn't have worked. But he came as a baby and he went through being a toddler and being a preteen and being a teen and, and, then, and then going through all of that. And then working hard, sweating, having body odor. Probably, he probably was attracted to the girl down the street too. But he had to deal with that because he knew he wasn't called to that. So he had to experience maybe that disappointment. He says he can sympathize with our every weakness. He gets it. He gets it. For we long for our body, uh, excuse me, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We, too, wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including, including, <laughs> including the new bodies he's promised us. There we go. We were given this hope when we were saved. Let's never forget it. We must adjust our expectations for what we expect out of this tempor temporal life as we compare it to what we're promised that we can expect in our eternal life in heaven. On earth, the Bible tells us to, I already said, so I'm gonna skip that. And Eugene Peterson, okay, he wrote the Message Bible. This is a great quote from him. It says, hope is not about the future. Hope is about the present. It obviously has to do with the future, but it's, it's a virtue which is cultivated in the present. We live right now with hope or hopelessness. That's the idea has to do with the future, okay, but it's not about the future. It has to do uh, with what we're cultivating in our heart and experiencing right now, cultivated in the present. It fills the present with energy. It connects the two comings of Jesus so that we are now participants in them. We're not just remembering the one at Christmas and believing in the other. We are participating in the continuity of the comings of Christ. The first advent and the second advent, we're participating in them because we have Christ in us, our hope of glory. Right there, we have both advents that we're experiencing right now. And on your Christmas celebration, celebrate that on steroids. <laughs> you know, just go for it. Hope like advent is all about the now and not yet. The problem with now that we have is we still have suffering. And we still have uh, crying, sighing, dying, all that stuff, decay and death. But there'll be a day when we don't. Yeah. 
And we have the hope of eternal life that gets us through so we can celebrate when somebody passes on into glory. And we can look forward to our own passing that way. God doesn't want us to just look forward to eternal life, but to live for eternity now. With an eternal perspective, now. Letting eternity inform now. It says when we pray, you know, that we're supposed to pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So one way we do that, though, is by doing this last point, which is number four, and that's celebrate well. Celebrate well. What we celebrate, we remember. Wait, right? What you celebrate, you remember. Don't you think that having Christ in us, the only true hope of glory, is worth some major celebrating? I mean, I'm talking about some serious partying. Like my granddaughter, Phoebe, here in the Christmas play. Oh, yeah, let's party. I'm going to get my Phoebe on. Oh, yeah. She <clears throat> Some people may be uncomfortable with the excess involved at Christmas time, with the celebratory feasting and the gift giving and all that goes with it. They ask, is this even biblical? Let's take a quick look at one scripture that, 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 that completely gives us liberty and freedom. This is in the Bible. As a matter of fact, it's talking about a holiday that Jesus celebrated. Well, he was there for 33 times, probably. Probably only remembered maybe about 30, except he was God. Maybe he, anyway, you know what I'm saying. 33, he lived 33 years. Anyway, he celebrated this 33 years. This, this uh, scripture is talking about a holiday called Purim. It's called Purim, okay? Here's what it says, Esther 9, 21 and 22. It says, he ordered them to, he ordered them, the king did, ordered them to celebrate the 14th and 15th days of the month Adar every year because during those days, the Jews got rid of their enemies. That was the month when their sorrow was turned into rejoicing and their mourning into a holiday. <laughs> they, were, they were to be days of feasting rejoicing and of sending gifts to one another and the poor. Which I also appreciate is a part of our Christmas traditions often for, for many people is to give gifts, you know, to give to the food bank and to give gifts to people that need them. Our Samaritan's Purse, is that what it, Samaritan's Operate, yeah, the Operation Christmas Child. Love that. So this, again, is referring to Purim, remembering this is remembering when the Jews were delivered from the Persians and evil Haman. The Jews still celebrate this today. Our first trip to Israel in 1999, we were there during Purim. They had huge parades. They were dressing up like Mordecai and Esther and evil Haman. And uh, they were all, and King Ahasuerus, I think it is. It was, they were all dressing up like all these characters. And they were feasting and they were celebrating 2,000 years or no, uh, that would have been like 2,500 years or so after it happened. Still celebrating. And Jesus would have celebrated that. They gave gifts. They feasted. Most celebrations that God set in order, most feasts, they're called feasts, all of his major holidays. Most of them last for like a week or two weeks. So we're kind of lame in, in, in American Christianity. <laughs> Although Christmas, I don't bemoan anymore the fact that it starts after you know, well, now it starts in the uh, fall, but uh, maybe just after 4th of July. But the, 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 I don't mind that anymore. Even if they had materialistic motives, hey, I don't, let's celebrate it all year long. So just as a practical tip for families, some of you, when we talk about keeping Jesus as a center and having family devotions, some of you feel at a loss. So we do read the Bible in a year as a family. And sometimes what we're reading is going, you, you go, I, I don't really understand that. Or how do we, I don't know how to explain that to my children. I got some very interesting questions for my kids as they were growing up. But there's an app. I'm just going to throw it out. You can supplement our daily Bible reading with this app for your families, as families. It's a great app I've discovered. It's called Lectio, L-E-C-T-I-O. It's Lectio for Families. It's just an app that will facilitate your family devotions. And, and it's been a blessing. I've listened to it. It's, it's for families. I've just listened to it by myself and loved it. Lectio 
for families, L-E-C-T-I-O. You can look it up on the App Store. We do want to keep Jesus as the focus, right? But uh, that's not hard to do after we learn what we learned today, right? He lives in us. He is our hope of glory. Let's celebrate that fact very, very well. God bless you and your family as you celebrate Christmas and as you uh, enjoy his presence among you as you're exchanging presents with one another. Merry Christmas. Excellent. That's excellent perspectives, Pastor Tom. And I think uh, any encouragement to celebrate more, I think we should all just take that advice. What a, what a great time. You know, I, I love the, the concept of, you know, as we're, we're celebrating the birth of Jesus into this world as a human, but really we need to remember the birth of Jesus in our hearts. As he's been birthed in us, and as we are reborn and being able to, to take, uh, you know, celebrating the birth of a child to really the birth of us spiritually and remembering all of the things that that encompasses, just like Pastor Tom shared. So excellent. We'll keep that in mind as we celebrate this week. Amen. Hey, some quick announcements real quick. Just want to remind y'all, we have the Perspectives class starting up on January 10th. It's going to be led by our very own Jesse and Dana Weaver. It's going to be an awesome class. Uh, it's going to be January 10th on Mondays from 6.30 to 9, each Monday at the Gladish Community Center. So if you want more information, check out the app or talk to the awesome people in our Perspectives community here in church. Excellent. And then um, coming up here, January is uh, our church's month to serve on Meals on Wheels. And so if you're not familiar, Meals on Wheels is, uh, is a community uh, um, service event that, that a bunch of different churches take uh, opportunity to um, deliver meals to the elderly in our community who are, are shut-ins, who are, they're not able to go out and get their own meals. And so um, what we get to do is, is simply deliver them. And so it takes uh, approximately an hour. It's usually done around the, uh, the lunch hour. Uh, and you can sign up for one or more times. Um, basically, you're, you're going to deliver two or three meals in, in any given day. And so if you want more information about that or you're ready, you want to sign up, maybe you've done it before, you, you understand the process, then what you need to do is um, contact Lily Sherman and you can do that on our app. Um, go to the church app and there's a banner on there. It says Meals on Wheels. And if you click on that, it's going to give you opportunity to email her and then you can either get more information or you can go ahead and get signed up for that. So uh, that's this January though. And so that's right around the corner. So we want to go ahead and, and, and get those time slots filled. Awesome. If you're new with us this morning, thank you for coming. You picked a great Sunday to be here. Merry Christmas. Uh, please go back and see some great folks back there at the Welcome Center. They'd love to meet you and give you a gift. Um, also, just some um, <clears throat> scheduling items to hit. There's no Wednesday service or church family chores, so that's this Wednesday and Saturday. But there is church on Sunday. Come on, y'all. So we'll see you there the day after Christmas on Sunday. And... That's all. Be blessed. Have a great, great Christmas with your families. God bless. Dismiss. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful snowy Sunday that we have here in Pullman. We pray that you have a blessed week. Um, just a reminder, if you guys need any prayer requests or have any needs, feel free to go on our app or on our website and let us know. There's so many ways to connect with the body, um, this church family, and we want to get to know you and, get, and connect with you as well. On behalf of Pastors Phil and Carrie Vance, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us and have a blessed week and we will see you next Sunday. You have been watching the weekend services of Living Faith Fellowship, a spirit-filled local church serving the communities of Pullman, Moscow, and the surrounding region. We are a group of people who love God and believe in His power to change lives. If you responded to the teaching today or have any questions about Jesus, the Bible, or how to grow in your walk with God, we would love to get in touch. If there is anything we can do to serve you, please let us know. You can connect via social media, our website, or by calling the church at 509-334-1035. God bless you 
and have a wonderful week.